you know, this pandemic has touched all of us, all, all of our companies, our families, our loved ones. Um, it has been a, a time of great challenge for the industry and for all of us as individuals. Um, and, and so now we're starting to think about what it's like to come back to a face-to-face -face world, at least part of the time. And, and so we want to take some time this morning to, to focus on a couple of sort of rebirth kinds of concepts. Uh, but before I go there, I just want to personally say how much we appreciate all of you for getting on an airplane and flying to join us in Las Vegas. And we also want to welcome the thousands of other people who are attending virtually. We can't wait to see you at one of our upcoming events in person. This moment in our industry, there are really, I think, two important things. One is understanding sort of where we are as a technology industry and what we have to focus on next. And then I think we also, and we're going to talk about this this morning with Doug Schmidt from, from Dell, what is it going to be like to manage in this environment? Your people, your teams, your customers, right? We are moving definitely to a hybrid world. And that is going to have a big impact on almost every part of your company. And Doug is going to be talking about that. When I think about where the industry is, it, it really is best looked at by the hard data. And as you know, we have an index called the Technology and Services 50, 50 of the largest tech companies in the world, and we take all their quarterly public financial data, and we, we say, among other things, how much of their total revenue came from products and how much came from services. And if you look back in 2008, these companies, these 50 companies, were selling about $2 of product revenue for every $1 of service revenue. Today, they're selling about $2 of service revenue for every $1 in product revenue. And if you look at that blue line, look at the last few quarters. Look at the trajectory of services-based revenue. This is all kind of services, right? Support as a service, managed services, something with the word service in it. We are moving fast and faster to a world where we are a services industry, a services industry. That transformation is done. It's done. We, if we're not, if you are not there yet, or you're early in this stage, look at the growth that you're missing out on. Right? This piece of transformation is largely complete. And that's been hard work. It's been hard work. Companies had to rebuild products. They had to rethink their services strategies. They had to do a lot of difficult things. And congratulations, because we're moved. We've completed this journey. We've all got services-based offers up and down our portfolio now. Some born in the cloud companies started with it on day one. That's the good news. The not so good news is we think we're only halfway through this transformation. It's not just about offers. It's not just about your services portfolio. We drew this picture, most of you know this picture, the fish, right? And we, everybody hates the fish, right? But basically what this diagram said was, hey, look, if you're a company on the left and you've got a product business and you've got revenue that you're recognizing up front and you've got a certain cost structure in the business and you're profitable, we said, hey, you're going to go on this journey where you're going to begin to do more ratable revenue. That's going to cause your overall revenue to trend down for a while as you switch from upfront RevRec to ratable RevRec. So that's going to have a little top line pressure on your business. And you're going to have to spend money to stand up these new offers. You're going to have to build your customer success team. You're going to have to build your as-a-service offers, build your managed services team. And so your expenses are going to go up for a while. And that was what happened, right? Many, many, many companies 
of the traditional large companies have not had the kind of meteoric growth over the last five or six years that they used to have 10 or 15 years ago. And part of that was because of this transition. So it absolutely happened. But there's a second part of the digital transformation journey. I'm gonna submit every one of you has this problem, right? You are complex companies. You are complex technologies. You are complex to do business with. And customers are increasingly beginning to reject that complexity. I mean, look, we loved complexity as an industry. We made a truckload of money monetizing our own complexity. We sold services to, man, you know, to implement the complexity and train on the complexity, you know, install, support, advise, all around our complex technology. And to do all that work, we had sales organizations that were massive. We had specialists in this area and that area, right? We had people on airplanes going to visit customers to do this or that or the other thing. And we largely got away with it. If you ask yourself honestly, most of your customers, do they spend more time managing, you know, and more effort on dealing with the value of your product or dealing with the complexity of your business, right? I mean, you know, just to find out who to call for what for a customer, it's like they need a phone book, right? Because there are so many different parts of our business, and often we don't even do a good job of talking to the other part of the business on behalf of the customer. And the partners are the same way, right? We have got tremendous amounts of organizational business complexity that is adding to the complexity of our technology. And we believe that won't stand. In 2013, how many people read B4B? Okay. In 2013, we wrote this book. And we said a few things in this book that at that time were super controversial. We put two frameworks on the table. One was this sort of B4B model, which I'll talk about, and the other was the financial fish. And the B for B model, the B for B book, said, look, we're about to go through a significant period of transformation where the, the question of who does what between us and our customers is going to change. As technology companies, we loved to build products. That's what we did. We were engineering-led organizations. And we found, over a period of time, that customers would be willing to onboard these com this complexity and really take responsibility for driving a business outcome. The IT departments of, at that time, of your customers were huge, right? They were very, very, very expensive managers of complexity. And we said, okay, hey, look, that's fine, that's fine. We can have a product business and we can sell complex products uh, but we're going to go on a journey here. We're going to go on a journey over a number of years, which we have since done, and we're going to have to have offers that meet customers in different places, depending on what they want for a particular solution to a problem. And, you know, we started, as a B2B industry, we started with this idea that we like to make, sell, and ship products. Started with hardware, moved to software. And interestingly enough, the customers were willing to take the product, own the product, operate the product, and translate the product into something of business value. Some customers did a great job of that. Other customers didn't do such a great job at that. But they accepted that that onus was on them. And then the cloud came along, and SaaS came along, and you did exactly the right thing. You came up with a huge portfolio of offers. If the customer wanted to buy a product and own it, you could sell them a product and they could own it. If the customer wanted you 
to manage the technology and drive a business outcome, you all of a sudden began to build the capabilities to go do that. You know, managed services is really about managing complexity. That's really what managed services are. Um, and if you think about that value prop, the basic idea of being able to go to a customer and say, we can steer you around the complexity and we can get you to the end value without you having to deal with a lot of these challenges, that is a super hot value proposition. You know, I think George Humphrey told me that cloud-based managed services is growing faster than cloud computing itself, right? Again, this is customers telling us that they really don't want to deal with a lot of these complexities anymore. I had dinner a couple years ago with the CEO and the, the head of sales of a very, very large public tech company, and they had just come from an event with their largest customers. And they looked like they had been in a prize fight and lost. And I said, my God, what's wrong? And they were like, you know, um, our customer, our biggest customers, and I'm gonna use a bad word here, our customers just told us to get this SHI, get this out of here. And they didn't mean get rid of the products. They didn't mean get rid of the value. They meant get rid of the complexity. Tired of heavy IT costs, tired of all of these things. The senior executives just want the value of your solutions without the complexity. And so we came along and we began this journey and we began to have different forms of revenue. Some of us still had a lot of upfront product revenue, others of us just have as a service subscription-based revenue. But the reality is our financial models began to change. And along with it, I would submit, and we wrote this in 2013, there were gonna be some transformations in the relationship between us and our customers. Customers used to accept complexity, and increasingly, we believe customers are rejecting complexity. We used to believe every solution had to be custom. Every company, every deal was custom. More and more, we hear that customers are starting to say, hey, look, I recognize that we may not be employing best practices in our business. Tell us what best practices are, and we will try to conform our business to those best practices. And that is allowing us to sell more standardized solutions, right? To be able to go and convince the customer that we don't need to just automate their old way of doing business, that you are the experts in your domain and you have an insight into how they should be performing a particular function inside their business. And they're more interested in that. And that allows us to stop with the high degree of customization that we've had historically. Another thing that we've learned is that the customers are less and less interested in owning and operating the technology. I mean, you know, you know you've read uh, all the statements about the role of business buyers and how many, how many business buyers are going around the IT department in order to make technology decisions. Um, and, and that's not gonna end, right? That's where the budgets are. The budgets are more and more and more on the business side. And they don't want to operate complex solutions. They just want to enjoy the value of those solutions. And lastly, we said, hey, it, it's going to be about tying to business outcomes. And, and that is it's so fascinating. We were having our executive board meeting yesterday, and we were talking about how more and more contracts, not nowhere near the majority, but more and more and more contracts are being tied to business outcome improvement on the part of the customers. That is where we're gonna head, right? And, and that's fair, that's a fair uh, uh, contract, right? If you deliver business value to the customer, you make money. If you don't deliver business value, you don't make money. But most importantly, I wanna call your attention to this one little word that we wrote in 2013. We said, hey, we're gonna go on this journey, we're gonna have uh, offers at all four of these levels. But at this level four, we said, hey, look, 
it's going to be about delivering business outcomes and maybe monetizing those business outcomes or at least selling those business outcomes, but also doing one more important thing, which is making it extremely easy for the customer to enjoy the value of your solution. And that little word, that little word, easing the path to the value of your solutions, I would submit to you is the next 10 years of our activity. How many of you are having discussions in your company right now about trying to reduce complexity? Okay, right. And you know, when John, I, I was backstage and I heard John say, how many of you are done with your digital transformation? I heard a giggle, right? This is going to be tough. We said, hey, you know, wave one was about hardware to software, on-prem to cloud, X as a service, standing up a customer success organization, and that's taken us roughly 10 years as an industry. It's taken us roughly 10 years to get to the point where we are today where we're selling far more service-based contracts than we are product-based contracts, and, and, it's, and the gap is growing quarter by quarter by quarter by quarter. That's great, but it took us 10 years to get there. Now we've got to think about moving from complex, hard to do business with organizations to simple, easy to do business with organizations. And I will submit to you that the customer experience, particularly the digital customer experience, is going to be the number one determinant of market share in industry segment after industry segment after industry segment. If you can deliver a great digital customer experience, ease the path to value, be easy to do business with, customers will stay with you. They will add your next service and your next service and your next service. And if you're late with a service that a competitor has already have, they'll wait. They'll wait because they enjoy your digital customer experience. And we've also got to be able to continue to climb this value ladder to build offers that we can attach to specific business outcomes on the part of customers because that's what our buyers want. We've made a lot of progress, but we have a long way to go. And so if wave one was about standing up either being born in the cloud with a SaaS offer or standing up your X as a service offers. Wave two is about easing the customer's journey to your value. And why is this so critical? Because when you look at this diagram of the fish, right, the promise was if you're on the left and you have a profitable but not very rapidly growing business, that if you go through this transformation, you can get to the far right where your revenues are increasing and your costs are going down. And in order to get there, you have to go through this phase of simplification because that is where revenue is gonna start to really ramp. If customers can get to value faster, they can get to value more easily and they can enjoy the value directly tied to their business outcomes. They're gonna do more volume and more volume and more volume and more volume. At the same time, if you digitize the customer experience and you take some of the complexity out, you're also gonna take down the costs that your company has. We spend huge amounts of money on labor. In every single part of our business, huge amounts of money in labor. We don't believe that's going to stand. We think labor's got to come out of the equation or certainly shift to more value-added roles. But if we get this right, we can grow faster. We can start to take costs down. Most companies didn't want to go through the investment in wave one. And now we have to go through this next phase. We are announcing a new book that's coming out in the first quarter of next year. And it's called Digital Hesitation. And really what this book is about is 
our view of the journeys that we see all of your companies going on. We see some companies who go really hard and fast on some of these transformations. We see others that hesitate. They go a little ways and then they stop. Is it because of funding? Sometimes it's because of funding. Is it because of lack of vision, lack of commitment? But we have got to stop the hesitation and recognize that our future is about a truly digital, simplified customer experience. And there are lots of things that we still have to work on. We have got to think about, you know, not having a, a, a portal in services for the customer that's completely different from, you know, engaging with marketing or, or, or on your website, right? Or education engagement is different than, we need end-to-end -end digital customer experience, end-to-end. -end. We need customer success at scale. There are still too many art projects. Customer success is not really funded at the level it needs to be. And in this book, we're going to give you what we think is an end state vision for what this is going to look like, what customer success at scale will look like. We're going to talk about how product managers and development need to think earlier in the life cycle about the specific business outcomes they're going to deliver and build product and service portfolios that guarantee the result. Product organizations have got to rethink, rethink their role, rethink the definition of what a product or a service is. We have to think about the partners. The partners who we rely on for so many things are going to be massively impacted. They've been already impacted by the move to SaaS. They're going to be more massively impacted by this move. If you try to simplify your business, which you will need to do, what does that do to your partners, right? What kind of partners are you going to want? And are those partners the ones that you do want who can add real value? Are there enough of them? There's this concept of low friction land. You ever heard of that, low friction land? It means allowing a, a customer to try your value in a very simple, easy way at low scale, and then if they begin to like that value, then you have a salesperson call on them, not the other way around. Think of AWS, think of lots of these things where the customer can go try the product, right? Try the experience, and then we can be highly targeted in our sales effort. That is gonna blow up. It's gonna, we are gonna be 100 times more targeted in our sales and service activity 10 years from now than we are right now. But these are big, costly transformations. Complexity, and I was talking last night at, at the cocktail party uh, about CPQ. How many of you have a simple way to give a customer a price? Okay, for those of you uh, attending virtually, I believe zero hands went up. Zero hands went up. It's not even easy for your sellers to get a price or your partners to get a price, right? Customers ask a simple question. What's it going to cost? Two weeks later, three weeks later, a million questions later, here's a price, but it could change, right? So this is occurring all over. We have thousands of SKUs. We have, you know, it, it, unlimited number of permutations of product and services that can be bundled together, right? We got to change all that. We need simpler portfolios. We need to sell a platform, and that platform has multiple products on top. And if you buy us, you buy our platform, and you're going to just buy service after service after service after service. We have to have a leaner, meaner sales organization that is more focused on big, on landing and big upgrades, right? Big expansions. We have to have self-service CPQ. We have to have easy to implement, easy to integrate, auto onboarding, value tracking, 
in product adoption, expansion AI, and maybe no renewal. No renewal. The value proposition, use it, if you like it, continue to use it, if you don't, don't. Right? This is the direction. Higher volumes, higher incremental unit margins, smaller lands and bigger expands, accelerated time to value, and a digital customer experience. And I'm going to come back and talk about that in a minute. This is going to be tough. Um, there are going to be lots of people who believe that this doesn't apply to their business. They're a big global B2B company with untamable complexity. How many of you have heard something like that at your company? We could never simplify, we're too complex. Okay, a lot of hands went up. This belief in untamable complexity is not going to survive the next decade. The human factor. This transformation is going to affect a lot of people and a lot of jobs. A lot of people and a lot of jobs. And we're going to hesitate when we realize that. We're going to say, hey, we, we like these people. We like their families. We like this organization. I like a big team. I love having a big team, right? It's going to slow us down. It's going to cause us to hesitate. But it's not in the customer's best interest. So we're going to have to overcome a lot of real emotions in this transformation. We're going to have to be able to manage multiple projects across the business designed to radically simplify the experience of, of, of getting your value. Do you micromanage them? Do you macromanage them? Do you let every department go do their own thing? It's going to be tricky. You know, you've read in the same literature that I have about digital transformations and the percentage of them that are, quote, succeeding, it's like 20% or 15%. And it's taking twice as long and five times as much for the companies who are truly transforming. But we've got to think about how do we project manage this massive simplification effort that we believe we're going to go through over the next 10 years. Here's another problem. We're going to be much more data-driven, as I said. We're going to be data-driven in our sales activity. We're going to be data-driven in our services activity. We're going to be data-driven in our uh, uh, product uh, definitions and, and product value relationships. But we've all got a problem, which is that that data is sitting in silos all over the organization. You got your data in your CRM systems. You got your data in your service systems. You got data in your ERP systems. You got data in your accounting systems. And what we really need is all that data in one place so that we can gain the insight to make us a more efficient and better company to do business with. I'm seeing, I've seen over the last year, companies really tearing their hair out over the simple issue, relatively simple theoretical issue, of getting a data set together that can allow that business to improve because the data is bad, it's missing, it's old, it's sitting in all these different silos, it's gotta come together. And ultimately, somebody's gotta write a check, right? We're still in the belly of the fish. Congratulations, we're halfway through the belly of the fish. We got more checks to write to get through the rest of it. And, and this is not something, we believe, that you can carve out of OPEX. You know, one of the things that's very interesting, when we look out at all of your businesses, we see that there are certain departments inside many companies that are plowing ahead and really investing a lot in creating digital transformation within their departments, and then there are other departments at the same companies who are not, right? This reality is a dependent on every part of the business transforming. Somebody's gotta write a check, and I think that person who writes that check has CEO at the end of their name. I don't think this is something that this transformation is something that you can carve out of 
two points or three points or five points of OPEX to be able to make this. I think this is a very, very significant experience. And, you know, this digital experience that we're talking about, you know, I think about it like this. Your features and functions and your operational capabilities, marketing, sales, services, and so forth, together in one platform. Think about that, your product features and your operating capabilities of your, to get, of your business together in a single integrated platform. We're a long way, most companies are a long way from that. But we're gonna be doing in-product upsell. We're gonna be doing in-product onboarding. We're gonna be doing auto integration. We're gonna be doing things that really blend together marketing, sales, and services with product features. And everybody's gonna sit on that platform. Your employees are gonna use that platform to deliver services, to do sales. Your partners are gonna live on that platform, and your customers are gonna live on that platform. But that platform requires a massive rethink of the underlying business processes in your business. You know, Jeff Bezos taught us that amazing things could be automated, but he started with books, right? Started with books, because the task of selling books was manageable. It wasn't wildly complicated. You bought a book online, shipped it out of a warehouse. And then Amazon took on bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger challenges. But they retained this notion of trying to simplify a process before automating the process. And that is what we've got to do. When we said as a service is going to eat the product industry, there were a lot of comments Skeptical comments among C-suite leaders. Uh, not gonna happen in our segment. Yeah, 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 I think, I, I understand, I read all that stuff, but it's not what our customers want. Our customers want to own the products. They don't want us in there messing around with them. Not true, right? Other C-suite leaders said, there cannot be a fish in our future. Well, there was a fish in the future. Others said, our customers will wait, they'll wait, and we'll get to this next year, or the year after, or the year after. The customers didn't wait. You know, you've know, seen that chart in the Wall Street Journal, it's an ad for Salesforce, and it shows Salesforce's market share, like over time, and then SAP and Oracle and all those things, right? There are customers who didn't wait. There are customers who went to other suppliers and I'm not saying that, that any of those companies I mentioned they weren't trying or didn't do it, they did do it. But by and large, customers who we always thought were gonna remain loyal to us ultimately got to a point where they left because the value proposition of a competitor was simply too great. And now we're coming along and saying, there's another 10 year journey ahead of us. And we're gonna hear a lot of pushback we're too complex, it doesn't apply to us. Uh, we can't get into this conversation about business outcomes with customers because we can't really guarantee uh, any kind of result. Uh, we don't wanna really scare the partners because we still need them for our sort of traditional businesses and we don't really wanna get in there and disrupt them. We've got this human problem where we don't wanna think about the possibility of, of you know, making significant changes in our org in order to accommodate a, a more simple environment. All of these things you're gonna hear. 100% guarantee you're gonna hear. And like the objections of the past, slow to move some companies, we are gonna say, look, it's very simple. Those of you who work for large, global, incumbent leaders, have scale. You have today the massive scale partner ecosystem, huge product portfolio, huge service catalog, all of these things, but it's incredibly complex. Then there are born in the cloud companies who were born with a digital customer experience 
And they are trying to figure out what scale looks like. How do I get to the same level of scale as these incumbents? But they're coming at it from a different way. The winners are gonna be the companies who figure out how to do digital customer experience at scale. They are going to be the leaders in segment after segment after segment. And you're either gonna get there because you're gonna to try to simplify a large global complex process and, and organizational structure, or you're gonna get there because you've got a digital experience now and you've gotta figure out how to get it to be bigger and better. Either way, it's gonna be a journey. There is no doubt the born in the cloud companies have a head start. They have a head start. Um, and it's gonna be harder for the big companies to rethink their complexity than it is for the smaller companies to be able to scale up their digital experience. The second thing is, as I said, customer patience with complexity is ending. I, I, I am sure you have had a customer or two tell you that in frustration, right? It's hard to get something done. It takes a long time, right? More and more customers are losing patience with our business and technical complexity, and ultimately, if they have to, they will switch. And it's about bringing together the operating capability of your business with the features and functions and value that your customers enjoy, right? We're gonna have to be able to perform all of the customer-facing activities through a digital experience. And that is very, you know, again, it may start with just your SMB customers, and then it may become your mid-market customers, and eventually it become, become your enterprise customers. But we're gonna have to be able to blend these things together. I don't know what the definition of a product is anymore. Right, what is the definition? What are the ends, the beginning and end of a product? Right, if you've got a true digital experience woven into that product, or the ability for people to learn about that product, to buy that product, to try that product, to use that product, to expand that product. The lines between marketing and sales and services and the products are gonna become so intertwined. And product management, product marketing, and services management and services marketing, we have got to begin to have these conversations at scale. Products are not just about features and price anymore. It's about the overall cost of doing business. It's about optimizing layer, optimizing land, adopt, expand, and renew. How many of your product managers wake up every morning thinking about how, expand, how they can make expansion an easier customer task, right? Legacy thinking. And I, this is important because many of the born in the cloud companies are managed by people who came from large incumbents. Still true, right? And this notion, this notion of rethinking, rethinking marketing, sales, services for a digital age is not necessarily automatic for a born in the cloud company. Because a lot of those born in the cloud companies, the leadership of those companies came from Cisco, or came from IBM, or came from Microsoft, or came from wherever it was where go-to-market was a big, complicated task. But we've got to get through that. We've got to get our shareholders through that. We've got to get our analysts through that, because we're not done with digital transformation. We have another 10-year journey that we're going to go through. Over the last 15 years, we've written five books. The first one, basically said in 2008, 2009, hey, our data tells us that we've got a consumption gap problem, that our developers are spinning up capabilities at a faster rate than our customers are able to consume them. And a lot of our value is going unadopted by customers. And we said, is that a problem? And by and large, back then, most companies said, well, not really. You know, whether the customer gets this much value or that much value, as long as they get enough value, it's okay because they're paying us up front. We're not, you know, we don't make more money if they consume more features and functions. Turned out we do care. We care massively. We're moving not just to subscriptions, but we're moving to consumption-based pricing models at an incredibly rapid rate, consumption-based. We care 
about how much of the value they consume, right? Then we said, okay, everybody's gonna pivot to SaaS. That happened. We said business outcomes will begin to trump features. And we're still on that journey. We're still relatively young, but when we listen to all the things we're hearing from many of you about more and more and more customer conversations becoming consumption-based or outcome-based, we can say, hey, this trend is absolutely going to continue. And we wrote a book in 2009 saying that this pivot to SaaS is a lot more than about hosting and pricing. It's a lot more. It changes every single part of the business. And now we're coming along and saying the next 10 years is gonna be a race to ease the path to value for our customers. And I'm pretty comfortable that the other predictions that we made starting 13 or 14 years ago along this way have come true, and they've come true because of our ability to talk to all of you every day, to look and listen, to hear the stories, to look at the data from all of your companies, and being able to put together this experience and that experience and say, hey, look, these are all leading up to something. And we've been able to accurately predict these things at early enough that companies could take action and take advantage of, as an example, the really, really rapid growth of as-a-service offers. And now we're saying it's about this path to value. And it is going to be something that's going to affect everybody in this room. Everybody in this room is somewhere on this customer's journey to value. You could be in marketing, you could be in sales, you could be in product, you could be in customer success, services, consulting, doesn't matter. You have got a role in escorting your customer to the value of your solutions. So it's not something that somebody else has to worry about. It's something that you and your team have to worry about because you own a part and maybe a significant part of this overall journey. And creating this beautiful digital customer experience is something we've all got to do together. We have to take the picture on the left and turn it into the picture on the right. A flower-led path that goes straight to your value. Isn't that what your customers experience today? A flower-led path straight to the value of your solution? We got a lot to do. We're gonna learn from each other. The TSIA community will continue to share success stories, best practices, data sets, insights, but we got a lot of work to go do. Let's get started. Thank you.